absolutely gotta love distributed load problems because, you know, it involves geometry and any statics problem that's just geometry is kind of awesome. So we're gonna try to solve this on paper and then we're gonna go solve it in SOLIDWORKS and see if we get the same answer, which is always exciting. What's really neat is it's actually a whole lot faster to solve it in SOLIDWORKS because when you're solving it on paper, you've got more work to do. Anyway, so what we're gonna do is we're basically gonna start by reducing each one of these little geometry shapes into its own force at a specific location. So I'm gonna treat these two guys separately, and I'm actually gonna treat this rectangle here separate from the little triangle up top. So there we go. Okay, so I'm gonna find each one of these separately and see how I go. All right, so let's start off with blue triangle part. Now, we know that there's this line that goes like this, except that we don't know where it intersects because all we know is that there's a length five and between zero and five, it goes from seven up to three down. So we have to find that intersection before we can do anything else, actually. That's really not a big deal because we know the slope of that line is rise over run and the rise is 10, the run is five, so the slope is two. And if you want to call it negative two, it doesn't matter because it's all going to come out in the wash. Anyway, um, so our general thing is y equals mx plus b. And in this case, our b is seven, I think. Yes. Oh, sorry. Minus seven. The way I have it written, if I'm going to have a positive slope, I have to have a negative seven. Um, so I want to know when is y going to equal zero. So when is 2x going to equal seven? It's going to equal that when x equals 3.5. So I'm going to posit that this distance here is 3.5. So that means that this distance here is 1.5 and that visually makes sense and I have no reason to, to doubt myself because I'm kind of awesome at slope intercept form. Okay, so we're gonna throw that over there for a while. Okay, now I can actually find the um, triangle force. So the triangle force is gonna be given by um, 1 half base times height. And for us, let's see, 1 half is still 1 half base is its base is three and a half and its height is seven and it's a positive force so i can leave it at seven this is just in the way i really don't need this anymore so we can go ahead and we can determine that that force is equal to some kind of number i don't know what that number is but it's that so 3.5 times seven times a half so 12.25 so the force is 12.25 and if i want to know the location of that force it is located at one-third from the fat side. So one-third from the fat side is one-third of 3.5. So one-third of 3.5 is 1.6, So essentially, if I want to rewrite the, um, the blue force, I can rewrite the blue force as a force going up at a magnitude of 12.25 and a distance of 1.17. Good? Beautiful. Okay, now I'm gonna do, so that's all blue stuff. Now I'm gonna do all yellow stuff. So for the yellow stuff, again, it's one half base times height, but now it's a force that's actually facing down. So I'll say negative one half base, which is 1.5 times height, which is three, and I'm gonna math through that again 1.5 times 3 times a half, so it's negative 2.25. Now its distance is again going to be one third from the fat side, but the fat side is on this side, so it's actually one third of 1.5, but really it's this distance all the way from the beginning. So actually what I'm going to do is I'm going to say that it's a total distance of 5 minus one third from the fat side of the triangle. There we go. So I've got five minus one third of the fat side, and that gives me a 4.5. So, so now I have another point that goes down. These are all in newtons and meters and stuff. That's cool. So this is at 4.5, and it's down 2.25. So that's my yellow stuff. Yellow stuff. And then I've still got blue stuff. Blue stuff. Okay. Now this guy, he's good to go. <laughs> he's super happy. He's like, I've been here all along. I don't know what you crazy people are doing. But he's 40 newtons. 
and he's going to be located at 5 plus 1 is 6. So I'm just going to write 40 at 6. Okay, now I'm going to look at the green part. Now the green part has a force and it's also going down and it's just base times height. Its base is 4, its height is 15 and that's negative 60. Its x location is going to be halfway in the midpoint, so it's going to be right in the middle because it's just a square rectangle thingy. So it's 2, but I've got to go all the way to beginning. So that's 5, 6, 7, plus 2, so 9. So I have negative 60. I don't really want to write the negative sign if I'm going to be pointing the arrow down just to be consistent. So I have 60 pointing down, and it's at location of 9. Okay, so that's the green one. And then finally, for the little pink guy, we'll say that the force for that one is again negative one half base times height. Or I wasn't really including negative before, that's okay. One half, its base is four, and its height is the difference between 45 and 15, which is 30. So its height is 30. And so that's again negative 60. And its x is located at, basically what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go all the way over here and then come in one third from the fat side. So um, I'm going to say the whole distance is 5, 7, 8, 11, minus 1 third of the distance of the triangle, which is 4. So I have 11 minus 4 thirds, thank you, or um, 9.67. Okay, so that means that just a little bit further along, so this guy is officially in the way, so just a little bit further along, I have another 60 Newton force pointing down, and he's at um, 9.67, and that's the pink one. So now I can basically throw away my distributed load diagram because I don't care about it anymore because I'm just reducing everything anyway. So now it's like I have a whole new problem, thank you, where I'm just looking at these. Okay. Okay, great. So now what I want to say is, okay, well, what are the sum of the total forces? So all the forces is going to be, I've got 12.25 going up, 2.25 going down, 40 going up, 60 going down, and 60 going down. And if I do all my math, I probably could do this in my head. Um, yes, because that's 10, but I'm committed now. Negative 70. And if I want the sum of the moments about point A, which I've lost, so um, the 12.25 is a positive moment. It's 1.17 away. The 2.25 is a negative moment. So it's counterclockwise, or sorry, because it's clockwise, because it goes clockwise moment. The 40 is positive. The 60 is negative, and the other 60 is also negative. So if I do all of that math, eventually what I'm going to come up with is something like 12.25 um, times where my 1.17 went, and then minus 2.25 times 4.5, and 240, and 60 times 9, and 9.67, and I get negative 876. So I get a total moment of negative 876 and this is in newton meters and this is 70 newtons and so this is giving us an idea of what strain is going on at a basically a is getting um, well it's getting pushed down harder so it's being torqued downward pretty pretty heavily and um, and it's also being pushed down so we can take a look and see what those are now the next goal is going to be to go ahead and plot these in solidworks and see if we get the same answer so let's see how far we can get on these little um, thingy, distributed load thingies. All right, so I'm going to start on the front plane, create a sketch, and I'm going to plug in like a little box. And I'm going to make the box 0.1, and I'm going to make it, I think our stuff was 11 long. Great. All right, now I'm going to actually come in here and put a midpoint because I want to connect everything down the center. Midpoint, and then F to make everything fit the screen again. Wherever my origin has to be, I'm going to click the little orange thingy on the origin, and then I come over here and control click and hit the other midpoint, and there should be a pop-up that says make coincident. If not, there's a little button over here on the left too. 
make coincident, hit F to fill the screen. Fully defined, exit sketch, all is well with the world. Now features, extruded boss base, 0.05 in each direction. Again, just because we'd like to have the center down the X axis because it makes us happy and satisfies our need for symmetry. There we go. Alrighty. Now the only last thing that we have to do here is put in a point for our 40 Newton force. So I want to see the bottom. Show me the bottom. Thank you. And I'm going to right click, create a sketch, and I'm just going to put a single point somewhere on there. I'm going to try to make it, see how that little white thing is coming up? And it says middle. All right, but just to make sure it's the middle, I'm going to click here. I'm going to smart dimension it at 0.05. And then I'm also going to dimension it from the edge. So edge, scroll out, scroll in, clicky click, clicky click. And it's supposed to be six meters away. F. There we go. Exit the sketch. Now, unfortunately, I can't put a force on a sketch point, so I have to turn that into reference geometry, not even really turn it. I just have to create a reference geometry with that point selected. So I'm going to select the sketch, click reference geometry point, and it should be on point, hello, on point. So point one, on point, check, yay. I'm going to rename this point my 40 Newton, that's not a four, 40 Newton force point for no particular reason, except that I like to name stuff. Okay, now we want to actually open stuff up and do a study, simulation, study, static study. Yay! All right. Now, one of the things we're going to do that's kind of weird and haven't necessarily done before is we're going to go in here and we're going to tell it to treat it as a beam. Okay, so we don't really care about the fact that this is a square box pole thingy. We just want to treat it like a beam because we have a distributed load on a beam. Now, when I do this, this little thingy here is going to pop up and say joint group, like, what are you talking about? And so you double click it. And it's really weird because all you do is click two buttons and it's happy. So I'm going to tell it to calculate and it's going to say, are these the two ends of the pipe? And I'll be like, uh, yeah, where else would they be? So I check. Okay. Amazing. Okay. The next step is to actually put the force point on there. So I'm going to do this simple one that I already know how to do. Force. Force point. Randomly pick a side. Okay. I'm going to kind of scroll it down. All right, is this the one I want? Yes. No, that's not the one I want. Let me see. I'm going to look at it from the side. No, that's not the one I want. Is this the one I want? No. Is this the one I want? Yay! Just facing the wrong direction. There's probably some better way if I was thinking harder, but the effort that it takes to figure it out is not worth it because I can just hit buttons until it matches what I want. Check. Amazing. All right, now the distributed load. This is the fun part. I'm going to go into the force menu. And over here where it says a beam, that means I'm going to have a beam, and I want this to be treated as a beam. If I don't do the beam, then the distributed load is really weird. So I'm going to click on that. The whole beam is, a, is itself. And then basically I'm going to look over at the top view. So make sure I see the top view. Whoa. And I want the forces to be on the top. Okay, so I've made that selection there. Now I'm going to look at it from the front again. And now where it says units, instead of saying just SI units, I want it per unit length. Then I'm going to come down to non-uniform distribution. Instead of a total load distribution, I'm going to get table driven. Table driven is really the only way that I found that's super easy and easy is like compared to doing it every other way. But for some reason, it always starts off as a default as percentage, which is just silly because I want it as a distance. And if I want it a certain way, then any way besides that is just silly. Minus seven, because it starts off at negative seven. And then it ends up at, after five meters, at three. Now notice this is really awesome because I didn't have to figure out where the intersection was, it's doing it on its own. Now if I scroll out and look, it's actually on the wrong side of the beam, which isn't a big deal because I can just click flip origin. There you go. And it's upside down because it's going up and then down instead of down and then up. It does this sometimes and I'm not entirely sure why, so I'm just going to change my values from negative to positive. Because I'll do this half the time and it'll be perfect and I'll do it the other half the time and it'll be precisely upside down. and. It's just not worth the effort to figure out why when it's super easy to fix it. All right, I'm going to add another force. Again, click beam, click the beam, and then I want the specific face, so I'm going to make sure I'm looking at the top. There, top. Now I'm to make sure I'm looking at the side again. Alrighty, per unit length, non-uniform distribution, table centered or table driven, and distance. Okay. So now for my distances, um, right at the zero, it's at 45. And whenever I go four in, it was at 15. 
and this is on the correct side, but for some reason it's upside down again. And that's weird, because whenever I did this before recording the video, it was not upside down, and now it is. But basically the idea is now you can see where those forces are looking like on that beam. And that's really actually kind of cool, and I always thought it was kind of neat, because you could go and you can look at this and kind of see, oh, that's, that's, that's where they look, and you know, change it and stuff. So then the last thing I want to do is I want to come over here and make sure that this end is fixed. Otherwise, if I try to run the simulation, it's just going to push down on the beam and it's going to rotate into oblivion. All right, beautiful. Not, ooh, it's going to yell at me for not applying my favorite material, which is always plain carbon steel. I'm going to run the study. If I look at the results, I click on the end. So notice that free body force isn't an option anymore, and that's because we treated it as a beam. But the good news is, is the reaction force already is going to have the, the moments in there. So this is actually kind of great because we have very, very similar numbers. Now you might say, well, these numbers are backwards because we had negative 70 and negative 875, but these are actually reaction forces, which is what would the force at this point have to be to negate everything else going on in the beam? And so essentially what we have is our former answer was 70. That's not what I wanted. So our former answer was 70. So we look at 70 and we subtract our calculated value. So our, our, our hand calculated value was 70. The computer spit back this, and so people get all freaked out, and they're like, the computer's not right, it's off by two-tenths. But if you look at the percentage that it's off, it's off by less than two-tenths of a percent. So we're not even talking about 2%, we're talking about 0.28% or 0.29%. So this really isn't a big deal. It's also not big, a very big deal for the other guy either, because the other guy we had is 875, and we had a, a measured value of 870. Four. So if we divide that out, we get something that's just really not concerning at all, which is, again, a, um, and it still came out negative because I don't care. And um, so again, a even less of a percent difference. It's 0.21% difference. So again, not 2.1, but 0.21. So with any kind of numerical analysis, you may or may not get the exact perfect answer because of the methods that they're using to solve it. But you can definitely do kind of like a dummy check of like, okay, yeah, this is, this is right in the magnitude of where it needs to be.